Tetris currently holds the Guinness World Record for the most ported video game of all time at 70, with implementations ranging from the Game Boy to the PlayStation 5, and most notably this weird keychain thing. We all have been asking for a front-end project for some time, so let's see if we can unofficially make that 71 by coding a Tetris clone in React. And we'll be using this version of the game from the official Tetris website as our inspiration for this project. To get started, we need to create a boilerplate React application. You can use Create React App here, but my hot take of the day is that Vite is objectively better than Create React App, so that's what I'll be using. If you've never used Vite before, then just run npm install Vite with the global flag to install it on your machine. Next, run npm create Vite to create a new project. Give it a name and of course choose React. And then I'll choose TypeScript here to avoid the pitchforks in the comments, but you're welcome to follow along in JavaScript as well if you prefer. Next, simply run npm install in the application to install all of the dependencies, and then run Vite to view it in the browser with hot reloading turned on. Now, as great as this counter application is, let's delete some of this boilerplate code to make room for our own code. In app.tsx, you can delete everything except for this wrapper div. We also probably don't need this CSS file. In fact, let's just delete that entire file as well as all of these SVGs. We also won't need these default styles in index.css, so let's delete those as well and just keep the file for later. Okay, so let's start our implementation by creating the Tetris board. That's the 10 by 20 grid that we see, where each cell is just going to be grayed out initially, and then as we place blocks, they should be able to change colors. So for this, let's create a board component. I'll make a components folder, and we can add it there. For props, we can take in a current board, which will be a 2D array of the current state of each cell. There's seven different block types in Tetris. So let's make an enum of all of the different possible blocks. We also have the potential of empty cells. So let's also make an enum for that as well. So now each cell can be either a block or an empty cell, and the board shape will be a 2D array of these cell options. And we'll need these types elsewhere, so let's go ahead and move them into a common types file. There we go, that's nice and organized. For the return value, we can return a div, and I'll give it a class name to use for styling later. Then we can just map over our current board props and create a new row for each row in the board. Also, make sure to give each row a unique key so that React can properly keep track of them. Then within each row, we can create a cell for each value. Let's make another component for this called cell that will take in the type of the cell. This will be one of those cell options that we created earlier. So for the cell component, the only prop we need is going to be that type. And here we can just return a div. We'll give the div a class of cell, as well as a class for the type, so that we can style each cell a different color based on what block type is currently in that cell. So that should do it for the board component. So let's go back to the main app component, and we can add the board to the screen. For now, I'll just make a fake 2D array of empty cells, but we'll figure out how to handle that as state a little bit later. We can also add a heading here for good measure. So now we have our heading, but no board. Or no visible board, I should say. There is a board, it just renders as a bunch of empty divs. So let's fix that with some quick CSS in our index.css file. We can give each cell a width and set the aspect ratio to make them perfect squares. We can also give them a border. And for the layout, let's make each row a flex container so that the individual cells will be laid out next to each other. And I think the board also needs a border, so let's say two pixels this time. I also don't want it to be selectable with the mouse, so let's turn off user select. We can also center our board and our title. That's looking better. But the board is too big, so let's set its width to fit content. And now for each cell, we need a background color. We'll use this gray color for the empty cells, and then we can give each block type a different color. That's looking good enough to me for now, so let's move on to adding some interactivity. Just to avoid making the app component too big, let's create some custom hooks to handle the state for the game logic. But before we can implement the hooks, an important next step is to make sure that you are subscribed if you're finding value from this content. It helps me a lot, and you get to keep up with all of the future videos. Sounds like a no-brainer to me. So I'll create a new file in a hooks folder, and we can call it use Tetris board. As the name suggests, this is going to handle the board state. 
The state here has two primary pieces, the board shape, which we've already seen, as well as the block that is currently being dropped. So let's make a new type for this. We'll have the board, as well as a row and a column of the currently dropping block. We also need to know what type of block that is, but then each block can also be rotated. So we could store a rotation counter, something like that, but I think an easier thing to do would just be to store the shape that represents the current shape after rotating if the player did rotate it. Block shapes will be 2D arrays of booleans. True means the shape fills that specific section, and false means it doesn't, so that would be an empty cell. And we can just hard code these shapes of all of the blocks in their starting positions. Then if they are rotated, we can simply rotate the booleans in the 2D array. Okay, so back to our use Tetris board hook. This is effectively going to be a wrapper around React state. Although given the complexity of our state and how closely these state values are related to each other, I think using a reducer over traditional state will be a better choice here. Initially, we can just set some dummy values since the game hasn't actually started. I will, however, add an initializer function to set the board to an empty board before the game even starts. For that, we can just copy over the code we had earlier for creating the empty board, and we can move it into a helper function. Now for the return type, this hook can just return our board state, as well as the dispatch function. For the reducer, we need to be able to handle a few different types of state changes. We need to, of course, be able to start the game, we need to be able to drop a square, commit a dropping block to its position, meaning save it essentially once it hits the bottom, and we need to be able to move the dropping block with the arrow keys. With switch statements, I like to also add this default case at the bottom with the never type. Essentially, this just makes sure that we are checking every possible case, and if we don't, TypeScript is going to give us an error message. For the start action type, we need to just create an entirely new state for the new game. So let's return a new object with an empty board. Then for the dropping row, we can set it back to zero to drop from the top. The column will be three to move the block towards the center by default. And then we can create a new random block for our first block, and we can use that random block's shape as our dropping shape. To get a random block, we can just get a random value from our block enum. Now for the drop action type, we need to increase the dropping row by one. Instead of copying all of the state values, let's just create a clone of the state. Then we can just edit the clone in the switch cases that don't require changing everything, and we can return it at the end. Okay, so with that done, we can come back to commit and move later, but for now, let's focus on getting dropping completely working. For that, let's create another hook. We can call this one use Tetris, which will actually be a wrapper around use Tetris board, but this one is also going to handle user inputs and the game logic like keeping score. First, let's just get the board state and dispatch board state function from use Tetris board. And now let's keep track of if there's a game in progress with an is playing state. We also need to keep track of how quickly the block should be dropping. I'll call this a tick speed, and we can use an enum for possible values. For now, the only mode is going to be normal with a speed of 800. This is fairly arbitrary, but it should work. So every tick, we want to dispatch the drop action, and we can keep track of these ticks with a use interval, which is going to run every tick speed milliseconds. But if we're not playing currently, then of course we don't want to do anything. Also, if you're unfamiliar with this use interval hook, it's one I use in basically every project. If you ever need an interval with React, you almost always want this use interval hook. The idea is to store the callback with a ref. Then whenever the delay changes, we can create a new interval in a use effect. If the delay was null, no interval gets created. And of course, on cleanup, we clear out the interval to stop it from running. Okay, so now as long as is playing is true, we should be dropping a block. So let's add a start game function so that we can have a way to actually set is playing to true. This is also going to need to set the tick speed, as well as dispatch the start action to reset the board. Now, finally, we need to also have a way to render that dropping block. And dropping blocks should render just like any other block visually, but I don't really want to add them to the board state before they're actually solidified in a position. So let's create a rendered board value from the board. This is just going to be a clone of the original board, but potentially with the currently dropping block included. If we are playing, then we can add that block to the board. So first, let's filter out any rows of all false values, because those don't affect rendering at all. 
Then we can go through each row we have. And for each set value, meaning each true in the shape, we can update the rendered board at that position, offsetting by our dropping row and our dropping column. Okay, so now from our hook, let's just return the rendered board as the board, as well as we can also return the start game function and the is playing boolean. That should do it. We should be ready to use the hook now. So coming back to the main app component, let's use the hook and get those current values. We can pass our board into the board component, and then we also need a start button. So let's create that inside of a controls div, but only render it if is playing is false. And now clicking on that button should start the game, which for now just means creating a random block and dropping it. Let's also try to fix the CSS a bit. We can make our overall app a grid with grid areas for the title of the game and the controls. Each column will be the same size and we can assign our grid areas for each part of the UI. We also won't need fit content anymore on the board because we actually will just get that for free with the grid. But once a shape falls all the way to the bottom, it's sort of glitching out and we want it to actually stop. So let's add some collision detection. We can make a new has collisions function that's going to take in the board, the current shape, as well as the row and column of the current shape. Then we are just going to check if it has any collisions on the board with other blocks or with the edges of the board itself. So first, let's trim off those rows of all false values. Then for each cell, we can check if it is set and if it is out of bounds or if it's in a board position that already has a block. Now in our game tick, if there is a collision, we want to stop but we actually want to give some extra time for the player to slide the block over. So let's say that if there's a collision, we are going to decrease the tick speed, meaning increase how fast there are ticks and set a new piece of state called is committing to true. Then once we get to the next tick, that is when we will say we can no longer slide and we will commit the falling block to the current position. So for the commit position function, let's create a use callback. First of all, if there no longer is a collision, that would mean that the player slid the block off of the colliding block, so we can just stop committing and reset the tick speed back to normal. Otherwise, we need to make a clone of the board with the shape on it and save it as our current board so that we can save the fact that this shape is in that current position. This is the same thing we did for rendered board earlier, so let's copy that into a helper function and see if we can just reuse that. Now we can set the tick speed back to normal and dispatch the commit board action. Make sure you're also keeping your dependency arrays up to date. If you're lazy like me, a good idea here would be to install ESLint, add React app to the ESLint RC file, and add ESLint to the Vite config file. Now ESLint will tell you if you mess up, and in VS Code, it can automatically fix the dependency array for you. In commit, we can take in the new board and save it as well as reset the dropping state similar to what we did in start. And now if we play again, our block should get all the way to the bottom and stop because of the collision. But we should be able to keep playing with different random blocks. So let's add an upcoming block state to use Tetris. Initially, this will be three random blocks. Then when we commit, we can get one of these blocks and repopulate the list of upcoming blocks. And when we dispatch the commit action, let's also add in the new block to update our dropping block state with. That should do it. Next, we need to add some keyboard events. When you press left or right, it should move the dropping block left or right. Pressing down should make it fall faster and pressing up should rotate it. Let's add a use effect to use Tetris to keep track of key presses. First, if we aren't currently playing, just return. Next, let's listen for key down events on the document. If the user presses the down arrow key, we want to decrease the tick speed, let's say to 50. Remember, a lower tick speed is a faster falling speed. Then when the down key is picked up, we can put it back to normal. Now for left, right, and rotate, let's create a new move action in the board reducer. First, if we are rotating, well, then we need to rotate that 2D shape of the block. So we can create a new version of that 2D array that's going to be rotated and filled with all of the same values. Now back to move, let's add action parameters to check if the player is pressing left or right. We can use those to calculate a column offset. And finally, we need to make sure that moving the block to this new position when it cause a collision, and if it doesn't, we can update the column and shape. And now in handle key down, if we press the up arrow key, we are going to of course rotate, and if we press the left or right arrow keys, we will dispatch with is pressing left and is pressing right. Okay, so this is sort of working, but if I hold down the up arrow key, it rotates way too fast. 
and if I press any other keys along with left and right, the movement sort of stops working. We can add a check for event.repeat so that rotate only happens once. That should solve that issue. Now to get more fine grain control over movement, let's save is pressing left and is pressing right. Then we can call a function that creates an interval to repeatedly call move. First it will clear any previous intervals it had, then it can dispatch move once, and then repeatedly dispatch it over some interval, let's say 300 milliseconds. Now the controls should feel much smoother and hopefully more consistent. Next we need to keep score and delete lines whenever they're completely filled, so clear them out. We can add some state for a score and make sure it is zero at the start of a game. In commit, let's delete any lines that have no empty cells left and keep track of how many we actually cleared out. And then we can add to our score based on how many lines we cleared. There's a ton of different scoring rule sets for Tetris, but this one will be simple to incentivize clearing more lines at once. The tallest block also only has a height of four, so this should be completely exhaustive. And now in the app component, let's just add the score to the page. Awesome. That is working. But now our board is shrinking. We need to add empty rows back in whenever we clear out any rows. So in commit, let's just ensure that the board always has the correct height, and that should solve that problem. Next, if we have no space left at the top to create a new block, well then the game should just end. That's how you lose Tetris. In the commit function, let's just check if we will have a collision by putting a new block at the starting position. And if we do have a collision there, then we can just end the game here. The actual Tetris game also has this nice UI to show you the upcoming blocks, so let's add a component for that as well. It can take in the upcoming blocks array as a prop. And then we can make a new div with the class of upcoming to hold all of the different blocks. And then let's just iterate through all of the upcoming blocks and get their starting shape, of course, removing those empty lines again. And now for each one, we can basically just create a mini board and just give these cells that should be empty a hidden class. Now in our app component, let's get the upcoming blocks array from use Tetris. Then we can add the upcoming blocks component if we are currently playing in place of that starting button. And in the CSS, we just need to add a hidden class to make the empty cells actually be invisible. I think a horizontal row would also look better here. So let's make upcoming a flex container and we can set the flex direction to be row reverse. This is going to put the next block on the left closest to the board. We can also add some gap between all of the blocks and set the justify content to flex end, which is going to left align it when we have the reverse direction. And with that, we have a fully working playable game. I'll leave it up to you as to how you can improve this next, whether it be by adding some more styling or potentially extra features. And if you did enjoy this video, then you need to watch this one next, where I actually make an entire programming language completely from scratch using only hate comments. I'll see you there.